uh, a little gender core chat. My name is Assembly Assembly, also known as Sigflub. You are taped to the wall again. And uh, this week's topic is, uh, it's actually by me, uh, one of my topics. It's um, how prevalent is a sexuality in stone in the gender queer communities, or community, um, and how does being gender queer generally affect your sexuality? Um, I, uh, I uh, actually don't know. <laughs> this first part, I don't really know. I, I hear asexual tossed around a little bit. And uh, so I was wondering, well, do other uh, gender queer people have something to say about this? Um, is this common? <laughs> Maybe it is. Um, and uh, so I, I was asking everyone else, actually. I have no idea. Um, I also don't know how uh, prevalent stone is, um, but I, I can tell you that that is something that I identify with. And um, how being genderqueer affects my sexuality. Well, I don't think it, I don't think it's so much that uh, that uh, that genderqueer affects my sexuality. I think it's more that my life up until this this point, everything that has made me the gender queer that I am has also made my sexuality. And uh, I, uh, I guess I'd postulate that other gender queers with similar experiences may have similar views um, on their own sexuality. I want to talk about stone. You've heard a few definitions of stone, and uh, they're pretty good definitions. But uh, I, uh, I want to define it more as a path, um, which is a little bit more befitting of, of me, um, I think. And the definitions you heard uh, were that uh, Stone is an individual who doesn't like to be given sexually, but would rather give which uh, I guess those are pretty good definitions, but uh, it's complex. Uh, like everything in my life, every, like most things, it's, it's rather complex. And uh, so, and I wrote notes. So if, if things are a little um, disjointed, I apologize. I hope I can weave these threads together. We'll see. Um, I have a lot to say about it, but I don't know exactly where to begin, but uh, I thought I should begin by telling you that, that my body is, is my home, and it's, it's where I live. It's uh, how I see the world. It's my interface to the world. And uh, I love my body, quite frankly. It gives me life, <laughs> um, but uh, but how I embody life is complex, and how I embody life is different than how I embody my body, if that makes sense. Um, how I came to be genderqueer is that, uh, well, I, I'm dysphoric with my body. Um, that's how I came to be who I am. And, uh, but not to the extent that I wish to emulate gender, a gender, because um, I don't feel that's a solution. My body is where I live, and uh, not in a construction of gender or expectations. I can't claim. Uh, to be comfortable, uh, or will ever, that I will ever be comfortable uh, with my own body. I don't think I will be. Um, I can't claim that uh, in my lifetime I will be able to separate myself from gender wholly. I don't think that's going to happen in my lifetime. And, uh, 
the heart of my dysphoria with my body. Perhaps not. But it's mainly what I think about. I think about gender a lot. A lot. And uh, as you do probably uh, as well, as most genderqueer people it seems do, as anyone that is, is, is aware of gender, <laughs> you're kind of forced to, to see it when you see it. See how things are engendered when they're not supposed to be. And uh, see how it affects people. And how it, how it, it, it builds structure to people's lives. Or in my case, um, unstructures my life. My, uh, my life is, is complex and experienced largely in silence, which uh, I'm trying to be more vocal. Doing this genderqueer thing on Wednesdays helps, most definitely. But it's difficult to find anyone talking about stone or any of these things in a way that you can relate to. And so I, I hope that someone can relate to me in me telling you about stone. I wear large clothes, clothes that are too big for me, in an attempt to obfuscate the shape of my body, which I'm not comfortable with. I try to present myself as my personality. And deep down, I wish that I didn't have the body that I do have. I'm not asexual. I'm actually very sexual. Um, but I don't make myself available sexually. At least not in an easy way. <laughs> I spent a lot of time building a wall to protect myself. To, pr pr to, to protect myself from what? I'm not entirely sure. But I know gender has something to do with it. And I know my anatomy has something to do with it. And I think this wall, this stone wall, if you will, in not wanting to be touched, and not wanting to be ma made aware of my body and my anatomy, is an active way to say to my lovers, that I want them to make love to me and not my body, if that makes any sense. In a certain way, it's a path for me to be free of my anatomy. I feel if I'm demanding that, uh, that I not be given pleasure. That's weird, but, uh, but it's true. And perhaps that's a lot to ask uh, for someone, uh, but, but it does work for me, actually. Uh, I mean, I don't, very rarely is it that, uh, that I have a sexual relationship with someone that I enjoy, that I feel deeply connected with. But it has happened um, there. I'm capable of that. There have been a few people that are able to melt my stone. And it's not really a wall, is it? It's more of an ice cube that can melt. I don't know. But uh, um, yeah, I like that term, melting stone. That uh, I want someone to melt my stone. I like that term. 
So that's what that's what stone means to me. And uh, I found this quote that uh, kind of resonates with me. Um, and I'll read it for you. I would rather never have another orgasm with a woman again than to be somehow made not whole or violated or controlled by that experience. So, thank you for watching. Take care.